Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming along today. I know for, for some of you, it's like during the work day, and in which case, well done for getting out of work to come along to this. And for those of you, it's in the evening. So well done to all of you for giving up time with your families. Uh, for those of you who it's the morning, I mean, just get some coffee. I don't know what else I can say at this point. Uh, but thank you so much for coming along. We're going to be talking about serverless and microservices and how they all fit together. And it is toward the end of my day in the UK. So this talk will be a little bit more ranty than maybe normally otherwise might be. I've had one of those days. And so I'm going to share with you some views. We will have time for questions at the end. And as Drew said, if for whatever reason I can't get to everyone's questions, I will make sure to provide some answers to you in the community group afterwards. So let's get started. Um, so some people know me for microservices and that's you know obviously something that I spend a lot of my time focusing on, but I got into microservices because really I like helping people get software into production, right? That's that's my raison d'etre, right? That's what I do. When I wrote books about the topic, that's what it was about. Oh, microservices are interesting because I want to help people get software into prod. And a lot of helping people get software into production is also helping people to make things simpler, which seems contradictory when you talk about microservices, which is how can I help people do less, avoid work, and avoid needless complexity? And so I want you to bear that in mind as we talk about some of the themes. The talk today is really split into three parts. We could talk briefly about cloud and serverless. I want to set a little bit of the landscape of where we are into our journey into cloud and why serverless is interesting. We're then going to take a look at how serverless and microservices can fit together, specifically looking at FAS function as a service and its interaction with microservices. And then I'm going to give you hopefully some advice about what you personally, yes, you should do about it if you feel like it and you're not too busy. So let's talk about uh, the early stuff, the cloud and serverless. And I want to start with a statement which I don't feel is going to be too controversial, which is that we are in love with our machines. I don't need to, but I have multiple computers sitting around here. I've got three pies. Uh, I've got a date. I actually have a comms cabinet in my attic. I can't justify that. I've got two NASs and goodness knows how many PCs lying around with me. And I don't think I'm abnormal. As individuals, we often fetishize technology, but it seems that that often also creeps into how we run our businesses as well. We like machines and servers and network cables, and we want to roll around in our data centers. Um, there are lots of stats out there that you can use to cherry pick information to reinforce your own prejudices. And that's exactly what I like to do. There's some interesting stats that IDC have. IDC uh, at capture kind of where money is spent in the IT infrastructure space as a whole. And at the moment, at least their figures line up with what I think. So I'm going to use them. They've been forecasting how much money is being spent on things like traditional data center infrastructure, public cloud and private cloud. Now, I've been working with the public cloud since 2008, and a lot of the kind of the narrative around that, certainly into the early to 2010s, was about everyone's going to public cloud, that's where it's all going. Interestingly, that's not necessarily what we see in terms of where money is being spent. So um, at the moment, you know, as of like last couple of years ago, we're saying 65% of all IT spend was on-prem spend, right? A mix of kind of traditional data center spend and what we call private cloud, which covers a multitude of sins. 2021, that's pretty much flat. Nothing much has changed. So the vast majority of the money we spend on infrastructure is still spent on our servers that we run in our data centers, whether you call them private cloud or not. Nothing much has changed even since 2018 in terms of a proportion of the spend. Now, increasingly, the reason people are saying, well, but these public cloud companies are making more and more money every year. The reason is because our total spend on IT infrastructure is increasing, but the proportion of that money being spent on public cloud isn't actually shifting anywhere near as much as we thought. We have a large rump of the enterprise that hasn't really changed. Uh, looking ahead, you know, IDC was saying, well, we think that private cloud infrastructure is going to go grow by 9%, right? The amount of money being spent on private cloud is going to grow compound around 9%. They think that actually over the same period, public cloud is going to grow slower than that. So public cloud might be growing, but nowhere near as fast as private cloud. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of private clouds 
kind of suck. And a lot of it, I think, is us just wanting to have our own servers. We want to have our own kit. And the experiences, unfortunately, deliver aren't always very good. Rather than the machines working for us, we often end up working for the machines. And we have a history of doing this. It used to be that when you had to run your own servers, all we had was physical infrastructure. You want another server, you have to rack up another server. Uh, around 2000s, we started virtualizing that infrastructure, which gave us a lot more kind of utility and flexibility. We could take a big machine that we had and break it up into lots of virtual machines, which gave us lots of flexibility. And this is awesome because actually it drastically improved the utilization of our data centers. I remember early 2004, I saw, I saw some studies that showed that the average utilization of data centers across the IT industry was about 25 to 30%. So 70% of our capacity was like unused, which just from a financial point of view is, is horrifying, let alone all the environmental and sustainability aspects. Virtualization though, allows us to dynamically reuse that infrastructure in new ways. And was great, fantastic. And then we started seeing things like the public cloud. Uh, the bookseller, Amazon, came along and said, use our computers. And then everyone went, oh, yes, yeah, you're a bookseller. And then everyone went, oh, this is actually kind of good. And then the problem is all these people with machines said, but I want to be on AWS, but I've got all my own machines. Don't worry, OpenStack to the rescue. Some of you might remember OpenStack. Um, some fantastic, amazingly good engineering work was done behind OpenStack. But the way it was sold to a lot of companies was you can have an experience on-prem like you get from AWS. <laughs> that didn't work out so well for most of us, unfortunately, but it's okay. You know what? We didn't get it right with OpenStack, but don't worry, I've got your back. You can have Kubernetes, and that's definitely going to solve all of these problems, right? You take your infrastructure, you slap Kubernetes on top, and everything's going to be brilliant. So, I, you know, I think people would like to think that we're getting to a better and better and better state. But when I actually look at what many people end up with with their private cloud experiences, I can't help thinking that rather than us evolving to a higher plane of existence, it's more like we're evolving from one kind of basic bacteria to a slightly more advanced form of basic bacteria. Now, this isn't the fault of Kubernetes itself. It's partly that Kubernetes, when you get down to it, is a platform for scheduling containers. That's it. It's not a platform even, it's a small part of the platform. If you wanna make a private cloud experience out of Kubernetes, well, which bits do you want? Which bits, anyone? Guess which bits? Now, to be fair, this is partly a sign of success. The CNCF have done a brilliant job at curating compatible projects, and this is why, this is a sign of success, but it's bewildering to help navigate this space. And if you are overwhelmed, they've got help for you. It's a little note at the top saying, are you feeling overwhelmed, stressed, tired, anxious? Uh, we can help you. There's a whole interactive website you can go to to navigate this space. But whenever I see this warning note on that over at the CNCF website, what I'm actually doing is interpreting how many of my clients see this. Okay, well, what am I supposed to do? That's okay. I'm going to get some really expensive consultants to tell me what to do. Let's be honest, Kubernetes is really good. But the idea that this is going to somehow simplify your world if you're running this stuff yourself is garbage. Your world gets more complicated if you own private cloud. Because let's think about the stack you've got to own. There's your hardware. Yes, because if it's in your own data centers, that's your hardware. And then the operating systems, and you've probably got a hypervisor on it to advise Hyperly and manage your VMs. And then you've got your VMs. Then you've got your container run times, and you've got, you know, Kubelet running on there. Then you've got the container operating system, and then you've got your application. And this is a simplified diagram of what is yours, of all the bits that you own and that you run and that you manage. Now, some of you might be saying, well, I do use the cloud for bits of this. Some of you may be running your VMs on the cloud, in which case those lower levels of the stack get offloaded. And for many of you, you're quite rightly thinking, well, actually, I, I suspect that Google and Amazon could do a better job of running a Kubernetes cluster than I can. And so you might offload parts of it. So maybe you're using managed virtual machines, in which case those three levels of the stack are now somebody else's mess. The stuff on top is still yours. Or maybe you're running managed Kubernetes, in which case you're offloading more and more work. If you're on the private cloud, all of that is yours. If you're on the public cloud, you get to offload some of this to hopefully people that can do a better job than you can about managing this. And this brings us to serverless. 
A misunderstood term for many people, serverless means Lambda. And the term serverless is actually predates Lambda by at least two years. Serverless is a way of describing cloud products that we've actually had from the beginning of the public cloud, but it describes any offering that completely abstracts away the idea of underlying machine, of underlying servers. From the point of the consumer, the point of view of you, the developer using a service product, it's like the machines don't even need to exist. AWS's first two products launched in 2006, uh, Amazon S, oh, sorry, um, S3 and SQS, Simple Queue Service. Right? Those are the first two products that were launched on AWS are serverless. You never had to provision machines. You never had to allocate disk space. They were serverless before we even knew what that meant. Nowadays, though, we just think, oh, serverless means fast. And of course, that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today, but it encompasses a whole suite of other things that we can use in those cloud providers, uh, like messaging solutions, different types of databases or storage engines. Back in the early, well, the late 2000s, early 2010s, we thought the world was going towards platform as a service. And what we've realized is actually, because it's very hard to find the right abstraction for a platform as a service, it's much easier actually to have a set of serverless products that you can assemble in ways that you like. And serverless stuff doesn't mean, it just means that you're offloading busy work that isn't important to you. And of course, when we think about function as a service, this gets quite interesting when we think about us as developers. I've written some code, just go work. Right, that's a naive view. This is my code, just go make it work. Lambda, cloud functions, they get us about as close to that dream as we've ever got to. When this thing happens, run my function. And if you think about what happens with that stack diagram I shared you earlier, when you use something like Lambda, you're just saying, oh, I don't care about that. Someone else can handle it all for me. Okay. Now, the devil's in the detail. Do you trust those people running that stuff for you? That's a separate conversation. How much do you trust your fellow developers? That's also a, a separate conversation as well. But nonetheless, this is about offloading busy work, offloading work that isn't about your core mission, that doesn't differentiate you or what you do from anybody else. And we've, as developers, as an industry, our history has been about abstractions, creating higher and higher level abstractions to allow us to do more and more things. We don't program in assembly anymore because we've got general purpose programming languages. Assembly was a step up from machine code. We would look to create abstractions in our code to make us more powerful. And it also comes in terms of how we think about our application infrastructure. From your physical infrastructure, we moved up into the words of virtualized infrastructure, infrastructure as a service. And then we started putting things like, um, you know, Kubernetes on top to virtualize our container management. And then we're putting things like function as a services on top, a higher level of abstraction, hiding more details. And maybe one day we'll get to a, a true platform as a service, but I'm not holding my breath. And as we come up in that world, as we get to more and more highly abstracted services, we are offloading that infrastructural overhead. Hello. We're, giving the, we're allowing the provider of the platform itself to handle that infrastructure stuff on our behalf. But we have to give things up to do that. We are now further away from the detail of how these services work. As you come lower in this diet, you know, lower on this slide, right? We get to the bottom level. That's where you get the absolute total control. And so when I work with people, it's like a lot of organizations I work with are trapped in this space where they think they want the option of that control. And so as a result, they keep themselves low down here, but they never actually really need it. And they're giving themselves up and they're buying into a world of hurt and pain and infrastructure and yes, servers. Now, we're going to focus a bit more on fast because it's a talk about how serverless and microservices work together. And so I'm trying to make the case for why I think fast is probably the future for how most of us will be deploying software in the next 10 to 15 years, you know. But I thought we should explain how FAST works in a nutshell for those of you who don't realize that FAST stands for function as a service. The most well-known FAST service offering out there is probably AWS Lambda, which was launched in 2014. Although when you look at how FAST works, there have been other similar platforms that do things like it as well. FAST basically works by saying, okay, I've got a piece of code and, um, and generically speaking, 
you can think of it as a, when, they, when we say a function, don't think of it like five or six line of codes, uh, five or six lines of code. Think of it as a piece of code, which has a defined entry point that's going to get invoked when some event happens. So I just say, here's my code. And then you say, when this thing happens, run this code with this entry point. So literally a method is going to get called somewhere in your code when something happens like an API call comes in or a message is received or a file is put into a certain location or based on a time. So suddenly Lambda starts looking like an amazing alternative to cron jobs, right? Rather than having to run a cron tab on a server that I've got to make sure runs, I could just run a time-based job like this. And so when X happens, the underlying plat fast platform is going to spin something up for me. If I have more requests coming in, I just spin up more instances. The scale up on demand is dealt with by the underlying platform. I don't have to say, I want 25 instances. I want five instances. I need this much CPU. I need to run this operating system. Nope. Here's my code, run it. The only thing you typically configure here is the amount of memory your function invocation has. And that's just because they want to charge you more money for more memory, right? And this is, the charging is interesting. You pay as you go. If your function isn't, invo isn't invoked, you don't get charged. Rather than having a machine sitting around waiting, you only pay for what you use. There are some downsides to kind of the kind of crumb crop of function as a service implementations though, that can't really be overlooked. Some of these are, are being diminished over time. The first thing is often the function invocations are time limited. Uh, that is increasingly less of an issue. I think the first version of Lambda, I think a function invocation couldn't run for more than 30 seconds, I believe. I think that's now 30 minutes. I'm struggling to think of many situations where I need to have one invocation running that long. And bearing in mind, of course, that, that function invocation could die. So in general, you wouldn't want to have that kind of a problem anyway. So much less of an issue than it used to be. Uh, likewise, you, you are often relying on the underlying fast platform supporting your runtime of choice. So it used to be that you could only run, say, a Java or a Python-based function, and they would have to support certain runtimes. Again, this is also being um, significantly uh, improved. You can now run your own custom runtimes on these platforms as well. So much less of an issue. What is quite a common challenge is that these are typically stateless invocations. So when you invoke a function, it's as though that's the first function invocation on that runtime that has ever occurred. And that means you can't hold state that is persisted within the underlying runtime between function invocations. Now, actually, many of us build our applications to assume this property anyway. So it's much less of an issue than we might otherwise think. And even then, there are exceptions. Uh, if uh, many of you have never spent any time on Azure, and some people are often quite sniffy about Azure, they do some really, really interesting stuff. If you really want to geek out, have a look at how Azure durable functions work. They basically use sort of seaside style um, um, continuations for making effectively stateful, stateful like processing of multiple functions. It's a really, really clever way of making this stuff work. So increasingly, even that limitation may well go down by the, by the, by the wayside. There are also limitations in how you scale up and scale down. Typically, you know, an invocation is gonna cause your function to invoke. Your limits are often, I only want this many numbers of them. Again, minor things. And, and a big issue is often you're relying on the underlying platform for telling you what's going on. And historically, the public cloud vendors haven't been great at using common standards around uh, sort of general observability hooks. That is also improving as uh, both uh, well, Azure, um, uh, GCP and AWS are all now going to be uh, all committed to supporting open telemetry, the new, uh, well, the current open telemetry APIs. So I'm, I feel, I feel hopeful that in the future, these fast platforms will expose those types of hooks for your own observability solutions. So that's great. Fast sounds great. I've talked a lot about public cloud, but a lot of you are saying, but Sam, we've got our own private cloud. So can I just run serverless on Kubernetes? And it's like, eh, yeah. I mean, look, we've got OpenFast. It's been around for many years now. I know the, know the creator of OpenFast is doing all right. It's been out there for a while. Um, that hasn't maybe gained as much traction as I would hope. Uh, we've also got Knative, which is in a bit of a weird space. Um, so Knative was originally, uh, was, was sort of developed by Google by themselves. They took it out of the CNCF, which I was always worried about, but it's now coming back in. And look, 
the, the gap between Google saying something's going to be cool and it actually being ready is vast, right? Typically, between announcing something and it being usable in production is about three years. I still don't know people running production workloads on Knative. You've got things like Cloud Run and things, but in general, the quality fast implementations you'll see in the wild that have good features tend to be the public cloud stuff. There's no technical reason why I can't, that gap can't close, but for those of you stuck on a Kubernetes only platform right now, I do think your fast solutions aren't as good as they could be, but you could be part of the solution. Fundamentally though, FAS and using of FAS is all about having less infrastructure to manage. Many of you are operating in environments now where you're, 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 you're saying, you know, we own this, we build it, we run it, we ship it, we carry the pages. And in that environment, you're often expected to own the infrastructure as well. Something like a FAS platform where these things are just handled for you is really, really attractive. And if you're spending less time focusing on infrastructure, you can spend more time on, you know, delivering value, making money. Now, I kind of feel that I've been looking for something that gave me that little thrill that I got when I first used Heroku for years. For those of you who don't know, I've uh, never used Heroku, it was, and still to an extent is, the gold standard for a developer-friendly user experience in terms of spinning up and provisioning applications to the point where multiple people just outright copied how it worked from an interface point of view. Cloud Foundry being a great example, that got completely rebuilt to copy the interface of Heroku. And we're still looking for something as good as that. And FAST is about as close as we've come to something that rivals that in terms of ease of use. And so I'm hopeful that FAST is the future, even if some of the current implementations kind of suck, right? I'm not gonna lie, they're not great. But let's talk, move on. Let's, we, this is a talk about the future. We're, being, we're trying to be optimistic. We're trying to be optimistic. It's very hard as a British person in Britain in 2022 to be optimistic, but you've got to have some hope. I mean, and I've, I'm also Irish, so I can always just move, I suppose. But anyway, I'm trying to be optimistic. Think about the future. Think positively. So let's talk about how maybe we can start using serverless and FAS in the world of microservices to maybe make our microservices easier. So here's a microservice. I've got the shipping microservice. I'm going to ship stuff. Great, ship, 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 ship. But I'm shipping so much, I need more. So I need lots of instances of my microservice, right? Because this is so I can handle more load. It's also to give me a degree of redundancy in case one of those instances dies. I can still deliver the services that I need to to, to my customers. And, you know, I talk to a database and over, you know, of course, I realize I don't want to, what well, if my database dies, maybe I need some kind of warm failover. So I have some sort of failover um, configured for my database. Maybe I'm running sort of, a, a, sort of a primary replica type situation. And I want these different instances and, you know, my backup database distributed across different failure planes. So that, you know, if say in this example here, I'm running in different AZs, if one of those availability zones dies, I don't lose my whole system. So if I'm working at the level of having to think about the numbers of things I've got and where they're distributed and that distribution across failure planes, this is work for me to do. If I'm using something like Kubernetes, some of this can be offloaded to Kube itself, right? Um, because when I say I want this many pods, it will distribute them across machines. Um, but there's even some limitations inside that. And Kubernetes does nothing really around state. So the database is based on me. So this is kind of the world we're in when we're thinking about managing these things ourselves. We also have this thing where when, normally when we think about, say, deploying a microservice, even on something like Kubernetes, we kind of assume that our microservice instance is sitting there waiting. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And they might not be doing anything. They're permanently waiting for something to happen. And that's kind of fine if you've got excess capacity. I and mean, we're normally talking about these things being deployed onto physical machines, VMs, or containers. It's normally always containers now, but you're paying money typically directly or indirectly for those things to sit there waiting for something to happen. So then we start thinking, okay, okay, well, it, this sounds great. Well, what if I move over to the world of FAST? Because then it's only gonna be used when it's invoked. So I'm gonna take my shipping microservice and I'm gonna move it to functions. Function, now I remember, I remember something, functions should only be six lines of code long, right? Yeah, that's a function. So I'm going to need thousands of functions, right? I'm just gonna take, take my one big microservice and go, functions everywhere. It's great. 
It's a great way to spend a vast amount of money, put a huge amount of latency into your system and just give you yourself massive, massive headaches. Um, beyond the fact that function vocations do get really interesting from a cost point of view, there was a great um, uh, presentation recently by the BBC. They moved their, uh, uh, their news pipeline over to a hybrid um, sort of uh, uh, server solution on AWS. And they've actually found that some of their workloads, they work really cost effectively on fast and some they don't. So they've actually doing some really interesting tuning around that. This is also just a really awful place to start, right? The management overhead here, you're offloading the infrastructure management concerns of a single function, but you've multiplied your pain and grief with the number of functions you have to so don't do this. If you're an organization right now that has microservices and you're interested in trying Lambda, this is a great starting point. Just, just have one big function, which is your entire microservice running as a single entity, in, instance in Lambda, Cloud Functions, whatever else. This is this idea of like function in this context doesn't mean a code function necessarily. It just means something with an input and with an output. It's quantum baby, right? It's just a thing. Right? So just that's, you can do this. Your microservice code base right now probably has a single entry point, probably a, your HTTP handler code if it's say a REST based service. There's no reason why you can't just package that up and have that as a single function. This is a great starting point for you. Because this allows you to say, well, look, from a deployment topology, this is not too dissimilar to what we have now. The difference, though, is that I'm offloading an operations work. And you can just try this. If you've got 25 microservices, just try it with one of them, see what happens. Do it in a test environment. It's not much, your code won't need to change at all. You have to do a bit of packaging work. This is a great place to be. So we're going to offload a bunch of our deployment work. We get this implicit high availability, pay as you go from the underlying service platform. And a lot of people, this is enough. You don't need to go crazy. I think a lot of the original conversation around things like Lambda, we were talking about very, very small pieces of code. And that was largely, if you look back at how Lambda was being sold back in 2014, was because it was often being written as a way to glue different AWS services together that didn't actually interoperate. There's little JavaScript things to take a thing here and put a thing there and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when it comes to these workloads, that could be a million lines of code, who cares? It doesn't matter. As long as it runs and spins up quickly. One of the things can be in here is, is your spin up time. That is a concern that some people have. You have run times, uh, say Java, uh, the JVM or the CLR if you're doing .NET applications, which traditionally are seen as having quite a slow spin up time. And if you're having to launch that runtime to take a function invocation, people get worried about what's called the cold start. In reality, that isn't much of an issue. Um, certainly AWS at least do a lot of work behind the scenes to keep those well-supported runtimes warmed up. And so it's actually often quite difficult to trigger cold starts, but nonetheless, that could be one concern for you. But, you know, behind the scenes, they're gonna send those requests to an instance that's always set up and running and not gonna charge you as it gets called, but it will still be sitting there because it's pretty effective to do that. However, you're thinking, Sam, but I want to go finer grained because uh, I hear that smaller services are better. Um, I would at this point tell you that size doesn't matter, but you're not going to listen to me. And so you want to break this thing down and you think, well, fast is making is reducing my infrastructure overhead to such an extent that I feel like I can be bolder and to go finer and finer grained. So if you are going to break things apart, well, how do you approach this problem? The first thing to say is that like if you make a decision to take a microservice and break it apart into smaller pieces, it's a really good idea to kind of hide that from the outside world. What do I mean by that? Well, look, here we've got a shipping microservice and these other little hexagons in the corner, these are other consumers that might be using your microservice in your, in your system architecture. They think they're talking to the shipping microservice. If you decide to break that apart into a lot of Lambda functions, do that, fine, but hide that fact from the outside world. They shouldn't care. I think I'm talking to the shipping API. Drew was talking earlier about, you know, Rapid being API first. I've got a shipping microservice which exposes a shipping API. The consumers use that shipping API. I make a decision as the owner of the shipping microservice to break it apart into lots of little functions. If I, all I need to do is some simple URI mapping, 
And those calls that go to the shipping API now get routed to the right function. I hide the fact that I've broken these functions apart from the consumers. Why do I do that? Well, why do the consumers care? They don't need to know. By hiding that fact from them, I also get to change my mind. I can merge those things back together again later on. You kind of want to think about your microservices a bit like they're being from the outside, from a consumer point of view, like they're black box. You shouldn't care what programming language they're written in. You shouldn't care where they're running or even how they're implemented. If you treat them as black box, this actually gives freedom to the owners of the microservice to change their minds about how things are implemented, about how things are deployed. You split the part into four functions. You run it for a bit. You don't like it. You merge it back together again. The consumers never even need to know that this has happened. So when you are starting to break things down, think about how you can create an interface between the consumers and your microservices that hide that fact. And I'm not talking about some thick kind of mapping layer. Something as simple as some URI mapping is good enough. In terms of how you find those boundaries, um, something I talk about in my, in my work a lot is this idea of modeling microservices around uh, business domains. And so using domain driven design concepts as a way of finding your service boundaries. We can also use those ideas to help us find kind of the smallest granularity of function that may make sense as well. And, and this is where we start looking at these things called aggregates. So in domain driven design, aggregates refer effectively often to a real world entity, but basically it's a collection of objects that you always want to manage as a single unit in terms of state management. So the canonical example of that might be something like an order and the line items of that order. Transactionally, you want to handle that and manage that as a single unit. And that's something we might identify as being an aggregate. When you've got an aggregate, you always want that to be managed entirely by a single function. If I have multiple different functions that all manage the same aggregate, I start getting into problems where that function and that function don't agree on how this aggregate should be managed and your world becomes a horrible, complicated place. So in this example here, we might have identified three key aggregates that the shipping microservice is responsible for, delivery, consignment, route. If I wanted to move into finer grain microservices uh, sorry, and finer grain functions, I would maybe create a function for managing those aggregates, but I wouldn't go any smaller than that. Otherwise you get into all those associated problems that can occur from trying to break aggregate management apart. So serverless, well, FAS can maybe help us offload some of the concerns around managing our function runtimes. So now rather than us having to think about, you know, how many instances of my shipping microservice I have and where those are running, I just say, well, now it's a function and the underlying FAST platform is gonna spin them up for me. It's gonna work out where they're all gonna run on my behalf and I don't have to worry about it. But of course, typically we were also thinking about our database and that's often in our world. And I would say initially, that might be appropriate when AWS, stick with RDS if that's what you're happy with right now, great. But once you've got those functions done and you think, okay, that's working quite well for me. Now the question is, well, what about my database? Can I go further? Can I use serverless for my database? Because then I don't have to worry about the scaling and all this, it's just gonna get magically handled for me. Uh, and you know, and the promise again of serverless databases is, is there, right? You know, handling auto scaling and high, high availability and pay for what you use. Ooh, yes, so at this point I'm like, yes. Now, when you run a, a microservice instance as a function, or in a container, the code doesn't actually change. The difference in execution environments are, are minimal, really. You, the semantics of the code isn't changing fundamentally. When you get into the world of serverless databases though, the semantics often vary greatly. If you're running MySQL, right, on RDS, for example, and then you say, oh, now I'm gonna use Aurora serverless. It's like, it's kind of the same. Even more, look at something like DynamoDB or Cosmos DB, right? Which, well, beyond the fact that like, what the hell is an allocation unit anyway? You've got this issue where now the way you store data is very, very different. The shift over to serverless databases and not, it's often like the shift from relational databases to non-relational databases combined with a whole load of other 
just confusing stuff. So I would say be very cautious about serverless databases. They're not turnkey like for like replacements with what you're used to. And you know, as a, you know, things like Aurora are trying to close the gap there, but this is one of those areas where I do think you need to be more cautious about because there are some changes there that can really, really hurt you. So I wanna give you some tips about what you should do with all of this, because this can be quite scary. I'm not advocating that you immediately shift everything over to, uh, to fast in production because I'm not insane. But I do think that if you are able to run things on the public cloud, at least that you would be, it would be a very good idea to explore what things like fast can do for you, because it may well hope you offload a bunch of work. Because look, when we get down to it, the secret to getting more things done is to avoid doing things you don't have to do. Often the people that seem really productive and seem to get loads of stuff done are just very good at not getting the things done that they don't need to. They might actually be seen as lazy in some other parts of their system, at least that's what I keep telling myself. They're not doing other things. They're doing these things instead. You could be those people. Why do you have to provision a machine and patch it if somebody else can do that for you? When AWS first launched and they were going around telling people why you should use it, this was the phrase that the, uh, they would use a lot. Amazon would talk about undifferentiated heavy lifting. And they said, the reason that AWS exists is because we found a need for this internally. We realized that our teams were spending time doing hard, heavy work that involves smarts and expertise and skills on work like managing infrastructure that was heavy, it was difficult, but it was undifferentiated. Your ability to do it didn't help you outperform your rivals, your rival company. Don't do it. Have somebody else do it instead. Get an expert to do it for you. And in public cloud, that undifferentiated heavy lifting is behind an API. Right. This is the other big thing about the public cloud versus your private clouds. Beyond the fact your private clouds are still run by, you know, companies that don't have anything like the economies of scale the public cloud providers do, the public clouds are all API first in a way that a lot of the private clouds don't deliver. And that's what gives you that self-service mentality. Think about the work you do on a day-to-day -day basis. How much of what you do is in the category of busy time? I'm not talking just about meetings. Meetings can be a smell if you have too many of them, but sometimes conversations are important. But how many things do you do technically at your keyboard that are things that aren't about writing quality software? What we're trying to do here is focus on what makes your product special and outsource the rest. If you want to get Uber management consultant around it, you could do some Wardley mapping at this point of view. Simon is available for consulting services. I don't get a commission. Um, but, you know, so Simon Wardley talks a lot about creating, a, 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 to giving you models to help you understand what are the things that are useful to you, what are the things that you can consider utility. And increasingly, an awful lot of the time we spend with our computers is just lowest, it's just utility work. You don't build your own kettle, you buy a kettle. You don't build your own email server, you use somebody else's. Unsurprisingly, Simon is a massive fan of serverless. Now this can be scary, so start off easy. Start off in a dev environment, start the test environment, pick something. Even if you're too scared to go all in on FAS or even start up the level of FAS, think about pulling yourself up a level of abstraction. Pick the level of abstraction that you're happiest with. You might need to push yourself a bit, but do you really need all that low level access and control? Pick the highest level of abstraction you're happiest with and that will make you most productive. You're gonna ease yourself in. Now, I think you need to start this journey because if you don't, people are going to leapfrog you when these things get a bit better. Now, I'm not lying. Some of the current, I think the concepts around things like FAST especially are brilliant. I think a lot of the current implementations of that suffer somewhat. AWS especially, for example, do not understand developer user experiences. It's just not in their DNA. Right, they're an ops-focused company, not a developer-centric company. But that's why things like the service framework exists. And this could be a good starting point for you. The service framework gives you a nice command line interface 
to wrap things like lambda or cloud functions on Azure. Don't buy into its hype that it can abstract away the underlying cloud platforms. It can't in any meaningful way. What it does do, it gives you a really nice developer experience for spinning up functions. Give this a go. Friday's coming up, right? Maybe you can get a couple of hours on Friday. You can you know, sign up for a public cloud account if you haven't already got one and just try playing around the service framework. You'll be surprised at how much you can get done in a very short space of time. But along above all this, I kind of really want you to think about the work you're doing and say, do we need to do it anymore? Um, there's a great blog post from um, Stephen O'Grady. He's a co-founder of Redmonk, who I think are the best developer-focused analyst firm out there. They are really focused on technology practices. And, and you know, I, 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 I like this stuff a lot. This piece is written back in 2015, and it was Stephen reflecting on OpenStack. And, uh, you know, he was reflecting on what he was seeing amongst their clients. And he said, there are legions of IT staffers that will be protecting what they believe is their livelihood, the private infrastructure at all costs. Unless technical leadership is unwilling to wage total war on its own infrastructure, then private infrastructure will continue to be a thing. Now, the language might be a little bit overly militaristic from my point of view, but we have an emotional investment in things that we have built. It's very hard to go to someone who built a great data center and say, we're getting rid of that and have them be committed to that journey. I've literally had conversations along the lines of, why do you have a private cloud? Oh, because we've got lots of machines, we want to make use of them. I go, okay, great. So you're making use of the machines you've got. Why are you buying more machines? Oh, because some of the machines we've got are approaching end of life and we need to replace them. Why are you replacing machines that you've got in your data center? Because we've got a private cloud. These are stories that go on over and over again. And it's just like, you might just have to rip the plaster off here. This was back in 2015. We saw a huge explosion of the use of public cloud as a proportion of IT spend. And that was because the early movers moved. A lot of what we're left with is, mm. and I do wonder if things like Kubernetes, not Kubernetes forward in any way, shape or form, allow us to indulge that sunk cost fallacy that having our own machines is a good idea. Anyway, um, if you know any more about microservices, which is kind of my thing, I've written a whole book and I don't rant as much in that book, although you can skip the rants. Um, you can get a, you can go read this book for free with your O'Reilly subscription. It's available in all, in some good and lots of bad bookshops um, and translations are coming, uh, although they'll be a while off. Um, but yeah, I, I think we've got time for some questions. Um, uh, how did you want me to the questions? Do you, do you want me to just read out the chats or did you want to go through the ones you want to? What, what works best for you? Well, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I think David had a question in chat. That's the one that I'm seeing. Um, he'll have to kind of unmute and fill us in, I think, on what point that was in your talk. He was uh, asking the question. But yeah, just take it away. Um, so just looking at the chat that I can see. So David, you were talking about, can Terraform uh, uh, do this? Um, I, so first thing I wanna say is I, I love Terraform. Like I get warm, fuzzy feelings about Terraform. It is really, really good. But a few things say about Terraform is firstly, Terraform is not developer focused and it's more a way of managing your cloud resources, I would say. So the role I see Terraform playing is I need to set up my cloud resources for people to use. Um, so I know people that will use Terraform to build their Kubernetes cluster, for example, and then developers will run on top of that Kubernetes cluster. The kind of aspects that Terraform can't really handle is well, firstly, how do I have an API call dynamically trigger a function invocation? Terraform is kind of operating much earlier in the process. And so please do use Terraform if you're doing automatic infrastructure provisioning or you're doing configuring of your cloud because cloud formation is awful, right? <laughs> it's way better than that, but it's just happening a bit too early in the process. And it's not really in the right part of the stack to solve these problems. What you could potentially use Terraform to do is to say, I want a Lambda function and here's how I'm going to configure it. But it would be more a way to configure your FAST platform than to replace 
your FAST platform, if that makes sense. I don't know, David, if you wanted to expand on that, or if that answered your question. Uh, thank you, Sam, for addressing that. I think that did answer the question because um, my question was, can Terraform be used to implement the framework that you're suggesting? And so I feel like there'd be like a, a Terraform template maybe or Ansible template that you could suggest. Yeah, yeah so it, it's the sort of thing like you could use um, Terraform or Ansible to configure Lambda for your team, but it couldn't replace Lambda, if that makes sense. So, so it can help, but it can't replace. Um, it, it's, it's, but I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, any other questions? We've got any other questions? We've got a bit more time if anyone's got any other questions. I hope it wasn't too ranty. Okay, any other questions from anybody? Feel free to just unmute and ask away. Hello. Hi, Phil. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this great presentation. Yeah, so my question is uh, simple. We have uh, a working bear salvation multi tenancy SaaS platform running on EWS EKS. Yep. And uh, we are handling tenant isolation by and we are also providing each tenant, uh, each tenant they own custom domain name uh, using our domain name. So they yep. have some domain and they have they own uh, client applications, they own uh, they own uh, data, databases and everything. But we are delaying in um, deploying because it's already working, but we can't deploy it if uh, we are not assured that everything will be okay once uh, we make like uh, some updates because we can have some updates in some microservices and we want to be assured that once we make a particular update or upgrade, uh, everything will be okay and uh, no data from our tenants will be modified or touch it. So yes. if we want to have some tips or idea that can help us to achieve that. Thank you. Yeah, You're, well, thank you for your question, Phil. Uh, I, well, firstly, the simple questions are always the hard ones. Um, but, but also I'm glad you're worried about these kinds of problems. So this is the issue that microservices, architectures, you've got lots of different things and you've got customers using your software in different ways. You're making a change. You don't want to break people. To start with, I would suggest, um, you know, this really starts, I think a lot of this is with some kind of automated testing would be a good place to look at. So these are things that you can actually have testing that applies at a service level that says, when I do these things, I expect these things to happen. The world of automated testing, a lot of the ideas in, in, in automated testing work just as well in the world of microservices as well. So you can and should have a suite of tests that run when you check your code in for that microservice. And that, that for me, I think is the easy stuff in a way. I think you've then got the kind of more advanced things that you can consider which is, you know, how do I pick up, I and mean, really all this is, how do I pick up problems before a customer sees them? Um, so another thing that you can do is that you can actually deploy, so you're gonna change your software, you're gonna deploy a new version of a microservice. What you can do is you can have version one of the microservice running in production and deploy a brand new version two of the microservice side by side. So I've got version one running and version two running. And you configure it such that only version one is being used by your external customer. But you can have version two running inside EKS, but actually route your traffic so that you can, you as an internal person can see version two in that same environment. And then you could actually run automated tests against it. If you see a problem, you can kind of revert that. That for me is a much more advanced type of technique. This is effectively what's called testing as, as an example of testing in production. But I would say the simpler things to start off with would be good automated testing. I've got a whole dedicated chapter of that in my book. If you wanna read the book for free, I shouldn't tell, my publisher would kill me if they heard this. You can go to O'Reilly.com. You can sign up for a free 30 day account 
I've got a whole chapter on testing. I think it's a seven day trial. The, test, the, the chapter on testing and the chapter on observability, the two you want to look at, Phil, they probably take you a couple of hours to read. You don't have to pay me any money and you'll get loads of ideas in there. But I talk, I mean, I still think testing, having a QA environment, these are good ideas. And then you can look at the advanced stuff, which is the testing and production. But yeah, go along to, um, if you go to my website, you can go to my book page, link through to O'Reilly, seven day free trial. We read the book for free and you're, and you're off, to, off to a good one. And if any of you have got ACM memberships, you can also get access to the O'Reilly stuff as part of your ACM membership as well. Yeah, thank you. That's a good idea, uh, especially the what you said about visioning uh, each, each um, like microservice V1, microservice V2, and providing and uh, regarding those tests. Yeah, I think that's the things we we should try because we yep. want to be assured that everything is working perfectly. Yes, That's because we are also dealing with. Uh, customer money using rapid API. So ah. we need to be assured that everything is okay. And thank you for your help. Thank you. You're, you're, you're very welcome, very welcome. Um, any other questions? We've got a few minutes left. Well, if, if anyone is feeling shy and they don't want to ask me a question, but you think of one in the middle of the night, you wake up in a cold sweat thinking, I wish I'd asked Sam something. You can find me on the internet and ask me a question on Twitter and I will respond. But anything else? Okay. Well, if you do want to find me on the internet, um, you can ask me questions on Twitter. I, I often suggest Twitter purely because when I answer there, I can do so in such a way that everyone can see the question and the answer and everyone gets the benefit. Um, but also my contact details are, are over there on my website as well. I, I just wanna say a big thank you to uh, Jacqueline at Zikoi for sending and, and um, Drew for setting this all up. So thank you so much for inviting me along to, to speak to the community. Um, tell your friends and family about the recording and about all the other awesome sessions that they've got set up here as part of the rapid family uh, sort of community of events. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for your time today, Drew. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, I really appreciate it. It was awesome. And uh, just so everyone on the call knows, if, if like Sam said, a lot of times you may step away and then you, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got a question, you know, feel free to ping Sam or you can ask it in our community at community.rapid.net. We also have our email community at rapid.net. You could just email us I either way. However, we want to make sure you have an avenue to get back to Sam so we can answer the question. Um, and aside from that, uh, what we'd like to do is send each of you a survey after this. Just let us know what you think. Let us know if this is the right format. You know, what type of talks would you like to hear in the future? Um, and we could, you can always reach out to us. Reach out to me, Kyle, who's on this call as well. We're both in DevRel, uh, community at rapid.net. We're happy to answer any questions and guide you along the way and provide any additional support. So just thank you, Sam. Really appreciate it. It was a great talk. And uh, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.